Hello, my name is Carolyn Musen Berkowitz, and my favorite thing is talking about Passover. Welcome to the Finding Favorites podcast, where we explore your favorite things without using an algorithm. Here's your host, Leah Jones. Hello, and welcome to Finding Favorites. I'm your host, Leah Jones. It is Sunday, April 10th, and Palm Sunday for those who celebrate. And oh my gosh, Passover is next Friday uh, for those of you who are Jewish. I am have had a wonderful day of editing podcasts and doing podcast interviews and reviewing the Seder catering menu with my upstairs neighbor, Ezra. We are ordering almost everything in from Manny's this year because it's because <laughs> <laughs> what why what are the reasons we all use catering? Um I'm doing well. I'm now like 3 weeks out from radiation and have started physical therapy to try and focus on getting my joints stronger, my core stronger, um and then starting to schedule all the other deferred maintenance from this past year, dermatology, rheumatology, neurology, um, just trying to pick everything back up that got dropped while I focused on treating my breast cancer. Um, this week on the podcast, I'm very excited. Um, we've got Carolyn, my friend Carolyn. Um, she is, you'll hear me describe, Carolyn is like the first One of probably the first non family member fan of Finding Favorites. Um, She listens to, she finds time to listen to a lot of podcasts. um, And we had been debating topics that she could come on. And she came on to talk about how she and her family prepare for Passover, to share some resources, to tell family stories. So this episode is all about getting ready for Passover. It's a nice long one. It's about 90 minutes long, which means you can listen to it while you are koshering your kitchen, while you, if you go grocery shopping solo, if you're um, doing any of the chores associated with Passover. But we also talk about how the ways that she gets ready for Passover are very applicable to Easter or Christmas or other um holidays that you host where you have special dishes, special decorations, um, special meals. So it's just a fun episode. This week, I got my second COVID booster. Um, I am allowed to get a second booster because uh, of the cancer treatment. Um, Probably also my weight. Obesity is on the list. There are a lot of things on the list. Um, So I have my fourth Pfizer shot and uh, continue to wear a mask if I can, not if I can, continue to wear masks, wash my hands, all that good stuff. This week I went to the Goodman Theater with about 28 folks from my synagogue to see Goodnight Oscar. It's a new play um, that Sean Hayes has been working on for seven years and and finally was able to open it in Chicago. And Peter Gross, who I used to go to synagogue with, is also in the cast. So we got a big group together and went to the theater. And the show was amazing. Again, it's called Goodnight Oscar. Sean Hayes shepherded it. He's probably, I don't know, the executive producer or something. Um, And and is the lead actor. Uh, He plays piano in it. And it's phenomenal. Uh, It's open until April 24th. And if you can get a ticket in Chicago, it is worth um, making your way to the Goodman Theater to see. Uh, So without further ado, I will turn this over to Carolyn um, to talk about getting ready for Passover. Get your booster, wear your mask, wash your hands, and keep enjoying your favorite things.
Hello and welcome to Finding Favorites, the podcast where we learn about people's favorite things and get recommendations without using an algorithm. Tonight, I am talking to, I think officially, one of the very first fans of Finding Favorites, who has, uh, we've been trying to find a topic and a time for the last hundred episodes when Carolyn would come on and talk. And now that we are two weeks out from Pesach, from Passover, a, a Jewish holiday that happens every spring, um, she she sent me a text and said, all right, let's talk Passover. Um, so this week I am joined by Carolyn Musin Berkowitz. Carolyn, how are you doing tonight? I'm pretty good. Pretty good. I'm so happy you're here. I, it is, you know, I feel like I talk to you all the time, but the truth is I'm just listening to you talk to other people. Right. It's fun to, act, it's fun to actually talk to you. I know. And it's been a... Uh, a long pandemic without getting to come and sit at your your wonderful Shabbat table. That is true. That is true. Hopefully we can change that soon. Yes. Yeah. So you were, we were figuring out a time tonight to record and we were timing it around your challah baking. Um, now, the, the episode that's actually going to, that I recorded last week, we talked about baking challah and I was obsessed with learning how to bake challah when I first converted to Judaism. Um, but I didn't know anything about gluten and that like, and the positive things you need to know about gluten and, and like you have to need the dough beyond it being just sticky. Like I didn't know, I didn't know anything. So I'd have these like Streganona huge loaves of challah that would like collapse in the oven. Um, but you were saying, tell me about your challah recipe. It's a perfect appetizer to talking about peso to pace pace over Pesach or Passover is to talk about challah, which is bread. So first of all, I will say the best way to make sure that your dough is kneaded the right amount mm-hmm. is to use a bread machine. Oh, um, I highly recommend. I I make challah every Thursday night, and I would not make it if I had to use my hands and like do the dirty work. I spend three minutes putting in ingredients, mm-hmm. and I turn on the dough cycle, and I and when it beeps, I come back and I braid. That's brilliant. I mean, my mind it, is blown. It, it it you know people say oh how do you do this every week and I'm like oh it's just part of my routine but like. It's three minutes, and then it's like five or six minutes of braiding, and then I put it in the oven. What time uh, do you put the dough in? Like, how long is the dough cycle? I think the dough cycle is a little more than an hour and a half. Okay. I'm going to be honest. I am I used to know, but I have a different bread machine now, and I have no idea. But I will tell you that tonight I put the dough in right before eating dinner Mm -hmm. and I was braiding. So that was probably around 6.15. Okay. And I was braiding right before eight o'clock. All right. Um, So it's maybe an hour 30, hour 40. And it, and that dough cycle, like it, it mixes it up and then it counts the rising time in like in as close that time. Um, so how did I get this recipe? Yes. So I've been making challah for many years, um, maybe like eight, nine, ten years. And uh, when I got married, my cousin, as a shower gift, gave us a bread machine with a wonderful recipe. And I tried it once and it didn't work because I didn't know how the bread machine worked. Mm-hmm. So I gave up for a while. I should try her recipe again. And I tried different recipes, found something that I liked. And a few years ago, I went to Atlanta to visit my friend Cindy. And I said to her, do you want me to bring challah for the weekend? And she said, you know, I've gotten pretty good at making it. You don't need to bring challah. I'll have it. Mm -hmm. So I was there um, over the weekend. I was there for Shabbat. And we're having her challah. And I'm kind of a challah snob. Like, Mm -hmm. I won't buy challah from the grocery store. I think that it's terrible. Um, and I was eating hers and I said, you know, Cindy, this challah is as good as mine. And then I said, "Mm, this challah is better than mine. So (laughs) I came back to Chicago a couple days later and I have been making her recipe ever since. 
So she has, as she said to me, as I was braiding tonight, we were FaceTiming and I was braiding. She said that when people ask her about it, she said it's an old family recipe called the internet. Mm-hmm. So if you go to allrecipes.com yep. and you look up bread machine challah two. <laughs> the number is, two. Yes. Yeah. That's the good one. That's the good one. I mean, I'm sure the other ones are good too, but I right. haven't tried them. Huh. And it's, all right, I could, because I loved, so also when I make challah, I have like whatever the first recipe was that I found and like a guide to living Jewishly. Mm -hmm. And it is like, you make the dough, it rises, you punch it, rises for two hours, you punch it down, it rises another hour. You punch it, you braid it, it rises two more hours. So it's five Mm -hmm. hours before you even get it in the oven. I mean, nobody has time for that. Nobody has time for that. Um, I was single and in my 20s, so I would do that on Thursday night. And mm-hmm. then on Friday morning, I would put the challah in the oven. I'd let it rise overnight in the fridge, braid it. Mm-hmm. And then Friday morning when I took my shower, I would put the challah in the oven. Oh, that sounds fantastic. That was pretty great. That sounds very good. Yeah. But uh, eventually five hours of like rise time just got to be just too much i completely hear that yeah i would say so if i started around six o'clock ish i don't really know today was a weird day for me if i started around six o'clock ish and at 8 30 it came out of the oven so that's that's two and a half hours total with very little hands-on time right right so you're also not like getting out of your nails getting like you're not doing this right i'm not getting the dough off your hands Right. And when you're braiding it, it's already like together enough. Mm-hmm. That it doesn't make your hands gross. Yeah. Oh, that's a good. I will link to that in the show notes. Excellent. Yes. Um, how is your. I mean, it's Chicago. It snowed today ish. Snowed ish. Yeah. It was frozen. It came from the sky. Yes. Uh, wow. How was your. Uh, sp- I, uh, spring, winter how's your winter going ending you know um i'm looking forward to wearing um i'm looking forward to wearing different shoes since Mm -hmm. i feel like i've been wearing the same shoes for the last six months um i feel like there were a few days when i could go outside in a sweatshirt jacket yep and that was pretty fab um but i feel like these weird springs and the crazy winters are just the price we pay for Chicago summer. Yes, I agree. On Tuesday, uh, I dressed for, I guess I dressed for Monday's weather or I dressed for like the week before's weather. Uh, I went to work in like Birkenstocks and a light hoodie. I did not wear a jacket. It was not appropriate. And my coworkers, we went out for dinner that night and they were like, Leah, Go into the company store, get a coat. You're like, we can't stand to look at you going out into the weather like this. And I was just like, I couldn't wear my boots another day. I was just over it. I needed a break from those heavy, heavy shoes. So I have these, I, unlike many people, I do not have a lot of pairs of shoes. Mm -hmm. Like I, I, it's just never been my thing. So I have this great pair of shoes that I wore all of last summer. And they're like spring shoes, fall shoes, whatever. And I can only find one of them. Uh Uh-oh. So I'm not really motivated to go through the piles of shoes by our front door. But I'm pretty sure the other one is there. And if I want to wear shoes that don't look like Uggs, I might have to find it. Yeah. Yeah, but the way the weather is going, you've got time. I do. To find the other shoe. I do. It'll be fine. Yeah. It'll work. (laughs) So I want to get into it because you sent me this outstanding outline. So, So things that I know about you are that when it comes to shopping for Passover or recommending podcasts, you are the most organized person in my life you like i think excel spreadsheets might be your love language 
Um, I think that's probably true. I do want to say before we get into this that um, I've I've been prepping for Passover for many, many years, like each year, not continuously. Um, and it is the single most organized part of my life. But I am not like this for like the rest of the year and for other holidays. Okay. And if I and if I could be this organized with the recipes and the lists and the shopping, like it'd be really amazing, but I'd probably implode. Yeah. Um it's a lot. It is it, a lot. It's a lot. It's a it's a lot of work, but you know, it's fun. Like it's it's just so different from the rest of the year mm-hmm. and so I really do like it. I don't like the week before Passover, Fair. but I really like Passover. Yeah. Um, let's start because everyone who listens is in Jewish mm-hmm. with um, how do you explain Passover or Pesach? We'll probably go back and forth with, with Hebrew and English and we'll make sure to define it. But when, when you have someone who's a non-Jewish colleague or person who's like, what is this holiday all about? Like, What's your on one foot explanation? I would say it's the core people making experience of Judaism, Jewish religion, and Jewish people. Um, the story of uh, of leaving Egypt um, from being enslaved under Pharaoh to going out to be a free people. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's an incredible story. Like from a from a literature perspective, it's an incredible story from a religious and spiritual perspective. But what I really like about the holiday is that unlike so many other Jewish holidays that involve um, that involve certain things going on in the synagogue, and, and Passover does too, mm-hmm. um, and my family, we're active synagogue members, um, what, I like about, what I like about Pesach, about Passover, is that it takes place so much at home Mm -hmm. and it takes place around a dinner table. Um, And as someone who, Excel spreadsheets might be my love love language, but I think that feeding people is also my love language. And and so I really, I I love it. I love being creative and there are dietary restrictions associated with the holiday um, such that we do not eat bread products. And there are so many ways that people live Jewishly um, that some people don't eat bread. Some people don't eat any bread products. Um, some people also add a group of foods called kidney oat, mm-hmm. roughly legumes, like corn and peas and green beans and rice. Um, and some do eat those. Um, and there are just lots of different ways to experience the holiday. And I like that the way we serve food speaks about who we are as people individually and as families. Mm -hmm. Um, I have so many memories of seders as seders, the, um, the special ritualized holiday meal on the first two nights, um, from my childhood, um, with grandparents who are no longer here and other relatives who are no longer here. And also memories of, uh, like making my own seder memories as an adult, Mm -hmm. um, and, and having, I don't know, it's interesting. You know, I always knew at one family, we had, we had these friends who used to live in our neighborhood in Lakeview, and we had satyrs with them. And I always knew uh, that we had chicken marbella at the first night seder. Mm-hmm. Like that was just, like, I, I've never made this dish. I, well, I've never heard not. of this dish. It's uh, like chicken and plums and it's cooked on the stove i don't really know what it is Mm. it's really good i think i have had this dish now that you describe it yeah it's it's really good you know it's just like oh what's that food that that people um had the first time they went to a seder and Mm -hmm. um and what's that thing Mm. that someone you know that someone always makes whether it's uh, uh maybe i don't know someone introduced me to this Thing that's called matzah crack or matzah toffee, mm-hmm. um, where you melt like butter and brown sugar, and you put it on top, and you put uh, you put chocolate chips on top and smear it around. And you know, it's very good. You can also make it with saltines. Yes, not Passover. Um, probably just as good. Um, yeah, I, it's, I just it's like, like a it's like a brittle layered on top of matzah, like almost yeah. like peanut brittle 
chocolate brittle layered on top of matzah. Yes. Yeah. So it's a toffee. It's delicious. It is delicious. Yes. Um, so I just like, I like the different food traditions that people bring. And uh, one of the things that I've, that I've really enjoyed over the years is having people at a, uh, meeting people at a Seder, having people at our home for a Seder and learning about the traditions that they bring. Mm-hmm. Um, it's so interesting to see and to think about having a, having a communal experience around your own table. Yeah. Yeah. I um, really have come to love Passover uh, because it's having, I love the tradition in the diaspora. So outside of the state of Israel, that when it's like a festive holiday, it's two days with the exception of Purim. And so I'm, I'm like, guess how, it would be so fun to have like air of Thanksgiving dinner and Thanksgiving dinner. Like I personally love that you can go to two seders and you can have like one with your family and one with this set of friends or um, Seder hopping on. I, I typically host a second night Seder. Um, this year I'm not because I, because of the cancer and trying to be realistic about like how long I can stand. Sure. <laughs> um, it, it's important to be realistic about that for a Seder. Yes. Uh, because it, I will walk more on like a Seder prep day than like for the months leading up to it because you're getting your house ready, you're cooking, you're, um, dragging chairs around if you're me um but i love that it's it's two nights around the dinner table they might both be at your home they might both be out there's a wonderful tradition of 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 welcoming the stranger so a lot of times you'll have someone or or like i will often have like a friend of a friend of a friend who i've never met like i love i love having people i've never met before at my seder that to me feels like oh, i did my job like there's a there's someone i don't know um and that person brings good stories yes yes and brings good experiences and and adds to the flavor yeah um, uh, of the evening it's really it's it's a special thing i've um i've been in this neighborhood for wow 17 years and i remember walking home from Seder's, uh, maybe walking half a mile, a mile home to wherever we were living and seeing other windows where there are people sitting around a table. Yeah. And yeah, it's like it, it's, it's so moving for me to think there are all these people having this experience at the same time. Yeah. And it's also the most observed of any Jewish holidays. That is true. In part because it's at home, it's a meal, and whether somebody's doing a very abbreviated Seder, you know, telling a, the story rapidly, um, or having a long lingering storytelling night, or um, it is it is the most observed, which They're I think is fascinating. They're still coming together. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I'm going to pull up your email quickly, because you have so many ways of of thinking about it um but i we talked about seder growing up but i can we time travel to the first seder that you were responsible for the menu um i would say when i was in college i had friends and we all sort of did a seder together Mm -hmm. and i remember very little of it except that it was wonderful i don't remember if i led seders at hillel at the jewish student organization on campus i don't remember i I might have but i remember doing this with my friends my senior year and that was fun yeah what does it mean to make passover you you've said this is the nineteenth year that you're you're going to make Passover. What does that mean for you? So, so to me, that means being responsible for preparing the food that I'm going to eat. Okay. So when I was in college, I went to the University of Iowa, and um, and the Hillel, the Jewish Student Organization, had a Passover meal plan, and unlike many larger universities, I'm learning there was not a kosher meal plan through the dorms. But like in general, but right. during Passover, Hillel had a meal plan. So you could pay whatever amount of money and um, 
and you could eat your lunches and dinners at Hillel that week, so you could have um, kosher for Passover food. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I was a kid. I was in high school before college, so I didn't worry about making food. Right. And I went to school, and I paid the money and showed up, and they had the food. Yeah. And I didn't really have to think about it. And my first year out of college, I was living in Skokie, mm-hmm. and um, I was working at a synagogue. And I remember thinking, well, this won't be too hard because, like, it's not hard to do Passover. I've been doing this my whole life. Right. And And you're in, like, a very Jewish suburb. Like, what could be hard about keeping Passover in Skokie? Well, it turns out that if you're not going to a place that makes you food every day, Mm -hmm. um, I got a little hungry. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, that's the truth. I got a little hungry and, like... On the third or fourth day of the holiday, I must have gone to Target or Bed Bath & Beyond, and I bought a griddle, and I started making matzo brai, started frying matzo with, um, with egg. And that was, I would not call that necessarily making Pesach, but that mm-hmm. was, like, the beginning of me being an adult and, like, figuring it out. Um, and so a few years later, I was in grad school in Boston, and I lived with two wonderful, wonderful roommates, and um, both of whom were Jewish. Mm -hmm. And I said, naively, um, so I was in graduate school at Brandeis, so we had all of Passover off for spring break, and they were both working. And I said, if we can agree to keep our kitchen and our apartment strictly kosher for Passover, I will cook everything for the whole week. What were you thinking? Now, now at this point, were you like someone who like cooked family style meals for your roommates or you were just like, this is the first time you're thinking about cooking the food for the whole suite? I think I was a control freak. Okay. All right. Fair <laughs> enough. Um, and and they said, sure. Yeah. And then what I learned, again, remember I said I was naive, I learned that you can say strictly kosher for a Passover and every person is going to hear that differently. Yes. Um, and so that was uh, a great learning opportunity for me, mm-hmm. um, for all of us. And uh, I lived with them for two years while I was in Boston. And the next year was a little different. And I yep. still was willing to cook for the whole week. But we we sort of changed our parameters a little bit so okay. that we could live together well. But we had... We hosted Satyrs there and just had a blast with all these other 20-something mm-hmm. single people. Um, we had this huge living room. or we I mean, we basically, like our living room, dining room space, and we filled it up and we sang until late into the night. Um, and so I would say that's what I would call my first year of yeah. making, my first years of making Pesach. When I came back here to Chicago, I was single and... And I was like, oh, well, I have to. And I I didn't, uh, sorry, not only was I single, I was also living alone. That's what Mm. I meant to say. And so I just sort of figure it out um, before I was part of a synagogue community and before I really knew people. And so I made plans for a week of meals, assuming, I I don't want to say, it sounds sad to say, assuming that I would not get invited to any meals, but it was more like, I want to take care of myself. Right. Like I'm responsible for myself. So if I do get invited to meals, that's amazing. And if I don't, you're not I have starving. A right. Because um, there are only so many days when cream cheese on matzah covers it. Correct. And yeah. as someone who doesn't eat cream cheese, not even then. Yeah. Um, Keep going, cowboy. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I would start to like make menus and Mm -hmm. figure things out and I started to invite people over for meals and I also got invited to people's homes for meals um and that's how I started coming up with like a whole plan yeah Um, my plan started with a clipboard um and on the clipboard I would make lists of recipes Mm -hmm. uh well first of all I discovered this amazing thing I don't think I... I do have it. Hang on. I know it's a podcast and so no one else can see it. We will discuss it. Uh, so this is the uh, CRC Kosher Certification Pesach Guide that comes out every year. Okay. And it has everything you want to know and 
don't want to know about this holiday. But the best, best, best part is they have this section in the middle called the shopping guide. And the shopping guide is color coded. Oh, look at that. So the things that are green, I can send you the link for this, by the way. Yeah. The things that are green, you do not need to have Passover certification. Okay. So those are things that you don't have to, because one of the things you do is you eat down your pantry. So this means there are some things that you don't have to get rid of and swap out for Passover. So I swap it out anyway. Okay. But it means that you don't need to get... So, um, oh, that it doesn't have to have like it, it doesn't need to have a Passover kosher symbol. On got it. it. I understand. So for example, you can buy white sugar, mm-hmm. like any white sugar, it's totally fine. So, um, because my family is strictly kosher for Passover, or one iteration of strictly yes. kosher for Passover, let's be fair, um, we I do buy new things, okay. Um, and I am eating down the pantry. As a way of making, we have a very tiny kitchen, mm-hmm. and a large pantry, so I'm trying to make space for stuff now. But so this, this shopping guide shows things that you need. The green um, listed items do not need any Passover certification. So Great. that in- also includes things like raw fruit, sure, um, it, or like kosher meat that doesn't have anything added to it. Then there's a like it's like a stoplight. There's the yellow section. It has to have reliable um, kosher cert- Passover kosher certification on it. Okay. And then there's the reddish, orangish section that's like, no, no, don't, don't buy this. There's like, there's no way it could be kosher for Passover. So like, don't go. Exactly. Okay. So I used to take this shopping guide and I put it on a clipboard and I would walk through the aisles of Jewel mm-hmm. with my list and with this as my guide so I could check it. And I kept this clipboard from year to year, and I kept my menus from year to year. And at some point, I started putting them into a Google spreadsheet. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, so the lots of people have trouble figuring out what to serve and what to buy. Right. And it's so tempting to go to Jewel and just walk down the aisle and be like, oh, this looks good. This looks great. Mm-hmm. But this food is so expensive. Yes. And, and right now, everything, all the prices on food are going way up even more so. Right. So I like to go in with a plan because this can be an expensive week of eating. It is yeah. an expensive week of eating. So what I do is, um, what I recommend doing is go through, make a list of food you want to eat. Mm-hmm. Go through cookbooks or the internet or that email that you filed away. Yeah. Um, and write down all of the recipes that look good. And also mark where you got them, because yeah, you're not going to remember. You're not going to remember where you got them, um, which you know might also include. This is on page ninety four of this cookbook. Right. Like, do, do future you a favor. I always like to do future me a favor. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you look at those recipes, and it's time to be realistic and say, I have thirteen different desserts on my menu, and I probably don't need them all you probably just need 12 right i mean to be fair my the 13 ones that that is a true number the 13 ones i have right now are for the whole week not just for the seder right but also i should probably cut it down to like half of that so then you can do and double the recipes well yeah yeah double the servings have the recipes So you get to be real. So then you get to be realistic and say, what will I really make? And what I did originally was I took each of these recipes I decided I would make and I wrote down the ingredients Mm -hmm. originally on originally probably on paper. Yeah. Uh, Before before Google spreadsheets. Um, And I would write down specifics eventually. And then I would put everything together to decide, well, it looks like I'm going to need 63 eggs. Mm-hmm. Um, so that I would know what to buy. Yeah. Now it's in the spreadsheet, so I just adjust what's – and it's in a spreadsheet, and I use almost the same recipes every year. I just sort of move them around by day. Yeah. Um, so it has it shows me uh, – you know, I know how many cups of sugar I'm going to need, so I know if I need to buy – I don't need to buy more than a five-pound bag, but if I needed to, I could. Like, yeah. I, it would tell me. And it does tell me how many eggs, and I have found – 
that if I stick to the recipes, if I stick to the plans, mm-hmm. um, which is a hard thing to do, but if I stick yeah. to it, um, it's pretty pretty good uh, estimation of what we need. Yeah. Um, and if you only buy the things that you need, then that makes it easier. Um, so I feel like, honestly, I feel like that's a good thing for holiday planning in general. I feel yeah. like I feel like a lot of what I plan for a, the way that I plan for Passover could be used for other holidays. Um, do you know about Dana K. White and a slob comes clean? I yes, I do. Um, so I love her. Yeah, she, her decluttering methods have changed my life. She's the one that is like, like if you when you start her program, isn't it like when you go to bed, your kitchen sink should be clean. Oh, that's Fly Lady. That's a different Fly thing. Lady. Okay, but I know a slob. My sister talks about a slob cl- comes clean also. So. so a slob comes clean. Her big things are um, when you're like, if you're going through stuff, mm-hmm. lots of people put things into piles. Like this is the, take this to the bathroom, whatever. She says, no, you have to take it there right away. And it seems inefficient, but you're going to run out of steam. Right. And then you're going to have all these piles to put away. So if you just put things away one at a time, then you have less to do. Yes. Um, So I have gone through all of her podcasts and um, she has several about Christmas. Mm -hmm. And I found them to be very interesting because she talked about having a whole other set of dishes and decorations Mm -hmm. and it changes the way her house is run. And I, I was like, you know, Christmas is not my holiday. I don't I don't celebrate this holiday. Right. But what she's saying, I can apply it to Pesach. Absolutely, because yeah. It is the same skill set. So I will tell you that what I try to do about six weeks before Pesach, and I try to do it at some other point in the year too, is we try to eat down the pantry. Mm-hmm. And we go through, it's a fun activity with my kids. We go through the pantry. We go through our chest freezer and our regular freezer. And we make lists of all the food that we have. And then we systematically work on eating it so that, you know, we're about to spend a lot of money on food for one week. Mm-hmm. We might as well use the money we've already spent on the food in our um, in our freezers. Yeah. So we've been... We've actually done a really good job this year. Um, We're getting there. Yeah. Does it help that the kids are eating a little bit more? Um, Like, they they grow every year. Yeah, it does. It also helps that I found three different kinds of cookies in the freezer. Uh Aha. Fantastic. Um, We we had to take them out. We had, uh, I took out brownies for last weekend. I was like, oh, these are in here. We have to eat them. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Those are the rules. I think we have two wedges of cake left, so I should probably take one of those out tonight. Yeah. Um, So I feel like that's that's a good way to start. And then I just, you know, I like the food prep part. I really, really enjoy um, creating things that that have been in my family for a long time Mm -hmm. or that I have taken in as recipes that we make. Um, I will say another thing, a great thing, for me with my spreadsheet is that I do a post-mortem every year. Wow. And so I, I remember one year I wrote, I had some recipe, some cookie recipe, and I wrote, don't make this recipe. You know, you want to, (laughs) you'll think it's going to be good. I I don't know what this recipe was, but it's, it was some kind of cookie and it spread. It was like a sheet of cookie and not in a good way across. Oh no. And I was, and I did it two years in a row and I was like, never again, Mm -hmm. but I made notes. So I just want to see, I have a note from, uh, this is from, I don't know if this is from last year. It says 2020 could have been from last year, even though it says two years ago, it says, um, make more roasted veggies. Don't have two different salmon recipes back to back. Just Uh like. Like this, don't buy this one thing. It didn't taste good. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's that's helpful, you know, because right. I'm not going to remember it. So I just feel like being organized in this way makes the holiday better, makes the holiday easier. Um, so we all know what to expect. Yeah. Man, that I truly, I do, I think a lot about what's going to be on the, 
on the Seder table. And then I'm doing matzah and cream cheese. Um, I do eat kidney oat. So like quinoa and rice. Mm -hmm. Uh, At some point I'll be like, well, a tortilla is basically Mexican matzah. So at some point I go out for Mexican because like, you know, when I get corn tortillas, so because I don't plan at all for the holiday or I buy things that I'm like, like I've seen people make matzo brai and I know it's like Passover chilaquiles, right? It's eggs. What are, what are chilaquiles? Tortilla chips and eggs fried in a pan. Oh, okay. Yeah. With like salsa. I mean, that sounds great with salsa. Yeah. I would say, I mean, I love matzo brai and I could make it every day. Mm-hmm. Um, the trick is you want to hold the matzo, you want to hold a sheet of matzo under um, running water for like to the count of 20. Okay. You want to get it good and wet. And then I put it in a bowl and um, kind of like smash it down. Uh-huh. And then I scramble the egg with it. Like oh. in that bowl. And I put. Um, My matzo bread is always very crunchy. I, and do. I don't. Well, well, it depends on if you how long you soak it, because it's good to have a little bit of crunch. I never knew to soak it at all. Yeah, so you're changing you my life. You know, it's it's a, if you'd like to come for matzo brai, you're welcome to come. Ooh, we will be here. Yeah, I find that it it can be hard to plan meals uh, for the holiday because I think a lot of people get tired of matzah. Right. Uh, and so what we try to do is have a lot of protein and a lot of produce mm-hmm. um, and have like food that is just real food. Right. Um, like that it's not all Passover substitute cake, Passover correct. substitute bread. It, like but, I don't, I don't make matzah, matzah like cakes. Yeah. Because I, I don't cook with breadcrumbs. So mm-hmm. I don't want to cook with with matzo Matzo crumbs yeah so like we do for dessert the first night like the first seder is chocolate covered strawberries because by that point people are usually full Mm -hmm. so it's just like a nice fun refreshing thing and like you melt chocolate chips and you dip in strawberries yeah and you know they taste good so i've done that for during the seder we've dipped strawberries and chocolate for for dipping Mm mm-hmm Oh, this is the best thing that I discovered mm-hmm. at a theater several years ago. It is the Carpas course. Yes. So Carpas is the second, third, fifth. It's it's very it's very early on in the Seder. I think it's second or third part. Um, and you dip a um, a vegetable into salt water to because the vegetable represents spring and the salt water represents the tears of slavery. Um, and so many people will dip some parsley and they're like, oh, it tastes like spring or, mm-hmm. or you know, they see parsley the rest of the year. It tastes like Passover, you know. Um, but I went to this, uh, the home of these friends of ours and they had a whole course and they had carrots and they had cherry tomatoes and they had terra chips. And you know, terra chips. Yeah. They're, yeah. Uh, back so you can get some. That are kosher for Passover. Okay. They are obscenely expensive. Right. Um, but like it's fun because they're regular potato, ch- like they're regular chips. Yeah. Um, and we, you could like dice to ma- dice potatoes and roast them, and so put all of those out, and then as you're carrying on with the seder, if people need to have a little snack, mm-hmm. it's right there. Um, I highly recommend. Carpass course for anyone who, like me, um, gets hungry before dinner. Right. Yeah. Or if you've got you've got some some kiddos trying to hang on. Yes. It's absolutely. really important. Absolutely. Put out some guac there. Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah. So I yeah. So we try to do a foods like that, like foods that are fun. But foods that are simple, um, you know, I make salmon for one or two nights, mm-hmm. um, and I make a few different kinds of chicken, um, just like regular chicken that I would make the rest of the year. Nothing yeah. too exciting about it. 
Um, my daughter loves brisket, so we will definitely have brisket and probably yep. be eating that through a good portion of the week. Yeah. Cowboy, you are killing me. Cowboy <laughs> really wants to be on the podcast. He really wants to be on the podcast. It's so funny. Yeah. This is, uh, I've been out of the house for three days in a row, right? Like, this is him getting used to my new, like, our new going to the office schedule is that I, by Thursday nights, he's like, I've got, I need cuddles, I need scritches, I need attention. Whereas when we were home for two years, he did not need this much attention because he, like, kept eyes on me, I guess, during the day. He just, he just wants to be sure. Mm-hmm. You know. I'm going to keep coming back. Don't worry, babe. All good. Yeah. Um, so how do you re- recommend, like, if I were going to start or if someone's going to start either observing for the whole week you know, it, it's like Passover is the most observed holiday because there's a dinner. But then lots of people maybe don't do the full week um, or 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 people that listen to this and they're like, Carolyn's really got it together. I want to take some steps towards that. How do you recommend people plan for the holiday? Um, I would recommend... Um trying to be realistic about one what, what you can handle, what your mm-hmm. household can handle, um, and maybe pushing yourself a little bit beyond that, but not too much. Mm-hmm. Um, and think about um, think about what works for you. Listen, yeah. I'm not a rabbinic authority. I'm not, you know, I'm not going to say this is a good thing. I'm going to talk about my experience. Yes. I don't want to take it as uh, this is how to do it. I would say um, that it's good to avoid bread products during the week. And if that's something, you know, if someone's looking to um, to increase their observance, um, to go beyond the nights of the Seder or the night of the Seder for some families that do one, I think that's a great way to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that other people um, might go beyond bread products to, like bread, bread, to right. um, bread, cereal, pasta, oats, etc. Um, I think there are lots of ways to look at what people do. I think that um, I don't think that the way that my family observes the holiday is the only way or the best way. I think mm-hmm. I think it's the right way for our family. Yeah. And there are lots of right ways. Um, I think looking at um, I mean, I really think that making a meal plan, which when I do it in my non-Passover life, it seems to serve me well, um, which is not to say that I am lately very good about doing that. Um, but making a meal plan helps you know what know what to expect during the week, know what to expect for right. groceries. Um, and I think that unless you eat pasta every night, and no judgment, because my daughter would if we would let her. Right. Um, um, I think there are lots of ways to eat um, in a Passover way. Yeah. Um, I think there are lots of ways to do that. There are, um, there are lots of ways to make choices when people go out to eat. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember when I was in college, I was talking, I was teaching Sunday school, and one kid said her family had gone to whatever restaurant, and they had gotten burgers and had said no buns. Right, um, yeah. And certainly in in, cert, um, in some areas of Chicago, there are places that have matzah. Um, probably yeah. Dick's and Benny's in Northbrook. Um, uh, areas that are like Jewish type delis, kosher style delis. Mm-hmm. Uh, places with a larger Jewish community might have might have that. Might not have that in our areas of the city. But, um, right. but they do exist. Um, I think that, so in our family, we change over our dishes and utensils. I think it's a very meaningful experience to yeah. do that. I would not advise that for someone who's uh, who's dipping their toes into more Passover observance. I think yeah. these things come with time. I mean, even I mean, even what I did, like it, it came with time as as I evolved and as I used to only use paper plates. And at some point, I realized, you know, I'm buying paper plates every year. I might as well buy plates. 
Um, right. And so I have, I have these awesome Passover plates. They are melamine plates from Target, and they are nice. striped. And those are the regular plates. And then I have little plates for like fish or for dessert or whatever. Mm-hmm. And those are polka dotted in coordinating colors. Oh, that's so fun. Um, so that was like the spring line at Target in maybe 2010. Yeah. And I used plastic silverware for years. And at one point I went to Ikea and got their cheapest silverware. Because I yeah. was like, no, it's one week a year. It's fine. Right. Um, I, I like I like opening the boxes of stuff because uh-huh. it's like, oh, these are my old friends I haven't seen in a year. Right. Um, like, And they- that's where it, it does like the advice about Christmas because people have Christmas china, they have Christmas linens that they only bring out once a year. Like that's where it becomes very similar. It's it's true, and it, and it's fun to look through those things. And it's you know as my kids are getting older, and one of my kids is really interested in stuff in the kitchen, and the other is not. But I think this might be a year to start telling stories about this is the thing that we that we got at you know this point in time. Mm-hmm. Um, we have one year. I put, I have, so over the years, one year I got a food processor, one year I got a stand mixer um, that I keep with my Passover stuff. And the the food processor has on, um, it has frozen duct tape, like frozen, Disney frozen. Uh-huh. Duct tape, like closing the box, because that's what we had that year. Sure. We close it. My daughter had a frozen birthday party when she was three, and my mom sent all the decorations and also frozen branded duct tape. So we have that like on our some of our Passover stuff. And I, I wrote on the um, tape closing the box, like sharp implement at the top. Uh huh. And every year I'm like, thank you. Uh huh. A you gift to future top. you. Yes. Um, so I think that finding those things, it's like it's part of the holiday. For me, the most stressful part is that we scour the kitchen and we're like mm-hmm. clean everything out to prepare to make it kosher for Passover. And that's the really hard work for me because once that's done, then I can start to open the boxes. Right. Uh, nothing gets open until then. And um, it's just fun to see. It's fun to to look at the things that are in there. One year, okay, I know you think that I'm kind of ridiculously organized, but after many years of not doing this, um, one year I made a tab in my spreadsheet for the bins that I have. Okay. So that I know, and and really that's very practical. Um, now I'm looking for it and I, of course, can't find it on here. But I, I do have one that says, maybe it's on the checklist. I, I don't know. Now I don't see it. Uh-oh. I hope I didn't get rid of it. But it said basically like this is in the like plates and bowls and silverware are in bin one. Mm -hmm. And, you know, or there's one that says like open this one first. Okay. Um, And I did that because every year I'd take everything out. And at the end of the holiday, I'd have to put everything away. Uh Uh-huh. And I, I would have no idea how to put it like how like how it was arranged. So one year I took pictures and then I took the pictures and put them in the spreadsheet like and, and wrote up so I would know. Nice. Although since I it seems I can't find it, I guess I have to document it again this year. Oh. Um, but also that's a good thing for Christmas decorations. You have to know which ones fit into which bin, right? Right. Um, like you have to you have to know um, where you hid away the china. I. I found a Facebook memory. So I write down in my postmortem, like, don't buy this. Mm -hmm. You have left over that, whatever. So I found this in my Facebook memories last in the last week, something that said, my spreadsheet says I have a hundred plastic cups in my closet. Does anyone know where I put them in my closet? <laughs> and, and, and I couldn't find them. I couldn't find I found them three weeks after the holiday. Oh, no. <laughs> like, I mean, it's silly. It's plastic cups. Like, it's right. not so expensive to get more. But, like, I kept uh, them. You ha- if you have a hundred already. If have, right. If you have a hundred, you should not need to buy any more. Right. Um, 
So it, you know, it's an exercise in um, quasi organization and living with chaos, mm-hmm. um, which is not, which is a what I do, and also not always my strong suit. Um, but it's nice, like the holidays. I, I just like for me, I have the time off of work, and my kids have the time off of school. Yeah, and it's a nice time to just sort of step back. Yeah, and, and think about um, where we've been in the past. You know. My son is is five and a half years old, and we were listening to a podcast this afternoon in which someone referred to doing satyrs on their own, mm-hmm. you know, like in 2020 and right. 2021. And he said, well, we've never done satyrs that were just our family, have we? And I said, well, yes, the last two years we have. Uh-huh. And my guess is... Well, I think that before that year, he probably wasn't awake for much of the Seder. Right. um, Because he was so little. But at this point, I will let my kids stay up as long as they want Mm -hmm. on those nights. The rule that we set with them is when you are tired, you need to go to bed. We're not going to make like a whole thing of stopping what we're doing. Mm -hmm. You can choose when you're ready for bed. And I will tell you, uh, they don't listen to the podcast, so I can say this. Yes. That I bought them a gift, not an Afi Komen gift. Mm-hmm. The Afi Komen is a point near the end of the Seder that's designed to keep kids' interest, in which a piece of matzah is hidden um, by the leader of the Seder, and kids go and look for it after mm-hmm. dinner. It serves as the official ritual dessert, um, and they get a prize for finding it. So I do have some Afi Komen prizes, Ooh. Um, but this is not one of them. Um, I ordered matzah pajamas. Oh my gosh. Um, that'll be so fun. It is. It is so fun. It's made by this, uh, uh, this rabbi in New York. Mm -hmm. Uh, Her business is called Midrash Manicures. Yes. She actually sells these decals. Like you can buy 10, 10 plague, like nail decals. She has dreidel leggings. She's got all sorts of fun stuff. Right. Um, but last year she made for her child these matzah pajamas. Yeah. And they're like, they're like, you know, your long sleeve and pant pajamas, but mm-hmm. they're kind of tan with like, like brown ridges for matzah. Yeah. So I'm super excited. I definitely want to recommend Midrash Manicures. Get your matzah pajamas. Um, so I have a recommendation to make. Yes. Well, another one. Um, I was really thinking, like, what are the things that I could share here that would be useful? Um, so the the ritual of the Seder um, is, um, we f- it's written in a book called the Haggadah, which literally means the telling. And there are lots of different um, Haggadahs that are out there um, for every stripe and flavor. Um, lots of options. Some people have a custom of getting a new one every year. Mm-hmm. Um, and like, it's, it's interesting to have, sometimes it's helpful to have everybody around the table on the same page, literally. So you can mm-hmm. say, no, we're on page 26. And sometimes it's really fun to have people on different pages. Um, in different books. In different books so that they can see what's in that book and say, oh, this is a, such an interesting uh, piece of commentary because the Seder is, you know, we're reading through the ritual text, but, you know, we're we're not widgets. Like, we have reactions to things mm-hmm. or things that are, that are interesting. So I bought a Haggadah a few years ago when it first came out, and I thought I was going to buy it for my daughter who really likes comic books mm-hmm. because it is a graphic novel. Ooh. And I have to tell you, um, I thought I bought it for her, but actually it's for me. Okay. And I I don't know if I should get more copies because I do not want to relinquish it. Like, I want to use it at the Seder. Mm-hmm. So it is called the Passover Haggadah graphic novel. Oh, my gosh. And the guy who put it together, who did the illustrations, I think... Okay, I'm not a comic book person, so sure. I don't know if it's DC or Marvel, 
but like he drew Batman and like worked and did Batman stuff. Wow. So like he kind of knows what he's doing. Yeah. And it's just, it's really beautiful. It has lots of pictures of women and men, which for me, very important to have representation. And there are pictures in, it's set up, it looks like a comic book. It has the Hebrew text on one side. Yeah. And it has comics on the other that go through, the, that that literally are going through every word of the text, but showing modern things. Like you have the, um, in the story of the four children, you have the wicked one, and it shows a picture of a kid like dropping his plate on the ground and being sent to his room where mm-hmm. he's kicking a basketball against the wall. Um, there are pictures from Soviet Russia. Um, there are pictures from antiquity that are wow. all drawn. Um, and I will say my favorite, favorite part, I had it open to this and then I lost it. Um, there is a, there is an illustration that shows the Jewish people standing in the parting of the sea. Mm-hmm. And the way it's set up, um, it looks like a selfie. <laughs> <laughs> the guy at the front is holding up his iPhone and taking a selfie. And if you look closely at the picture, at the drawings of people in it, many of them are probably just like drawings. Right. But uh, if you know Jewish figures, you will see in there Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs. You'll see David Ben-Gurion. Um, you'll see Natan Sharansky. I'm sure there are famous women in here too. Those, these are just the first ones I've seen. Yeah. Um, there are many, like, I would love to hear from the author, like, who are all of the people who he put mm-hmm. in here? But I love that he's saying, you know, we say um, that everyone, the entire Jewish community, um, was standing at Sinai right. when the Torah was given. Um, people who were born Jewish, people who became Jewish later, we were all there. Right. And I feel like that's what the that's what the artist is really portraying in this splitting of the sea with everyone standing there also. Um, so this is my favorite page of of this particular Haggadah. Um, oh, but I that's think it's neat. A really cool thing just to look through. Yeah. I went to one Seder many years ago. Uh, actually, Facebook memories just showed it to me today. Um, like the, the, you know, whatever it was I said on my way to that Seder, but it was early in my Jewish life, maybe like four or five years in. And it was a Seder where everybody had a different Haggadah and I did not have the literacy yet to not be on the same page as everyone. And it was so hard for me. So hard. But then this last year, when it was just, first night was just Ezra and I at the table, Mm -hmm. and we each had a different Haggadah, and um, he kind of guided, like, first night he did, second night I I led. Um, But we did each have a different Haggadah, and I was like, oh my gosh, I've gotten to the place where I can have multiple Haggadot in front of me, I can, I can, uh, I, I don't know. For me, it was, it was like this, this proof, like the proof that I've, like my literacy, my Jewish literacy has grown to the place where I am now comfortable being at a table where we're using different books and we're sharing different readings. But boy, that first time I went to one, I, uh, it was like the hosts were lovely and I could not escape, um, so I got through it, but I was so confused. You know, I went to a Seder once. Um, it, it was a lovely Seder of extremely educated Jews. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've been going to Seders all of my life, but not necessarily with extremely educated Jews mm-hmm. all of my life. And this family did something wonderful for the the. Um, middle-ish part of the Seder, the the Magid part where you're telling the story, they said, we're going to leave the table and we went to the living room and we sat on couches. Mm -hmm. We were all reclining and we were all cozy and comfy until the point that we needed to come back to the table um, for that portion. And what the leader said was, 
you can read your, like, we went around in a circle because I think, um, I don't, I don't know if everyone does that, but I think that everyone I know who goes to Seder's yeah. um, does that, um, where you go around and every person reads a paragraph um, and then everyone gets to participate. And what the leader said was, you can read your, you know, your section in English, in Hebrew, or in whatever language you choose. Mm-hmm. And that was fascinating as I... As um, I sat and watched all of these incredibly educated people, and I definitely felt like, I'm just going to read it in English. Right. Um, it, you know, it's an, it was very interesting. But people had cool uh, uh, commentary and things to share. Um, when I don't think, I think when I was dating Neil... Before we were married, we went to a Seder of friends of his and they had everyone tell the four questions in a different language. And they had a book that had them. Oh, in wow. Dozens of languages. Um, it's just it's it's very interesting to see the different um, the different things that people uh, put in and, and get people involved with. Yeah. Do you put anything additional on your Seder plate? Um, I put, uh, I do like a clementine, Mm -hmm. uh, which is for the inclusion of LGBTQ Jews in our community. Right. It it has gotten kind of bastardized as it being about women, representation of women. And then people are like, no, no, no. It actually comes from this, this other place. And so I, I do... A tangerine, and then I also include a reading that explains, like, you probably think it's for this, but it's also it's really, you know, this. Um, and then I've been talking to some people uh, that this year to put a sunflower on the Seder plate for Ukraine. You know, I have not seen that, but I've seen people say you should put olives on the Seder plate. Um, mm. because olives are like a sign of peace, like yeah. olives, like in a dove's. Uh, beak and, and all of that um this seder that we went to with the four questions in dozens of languages they also put potato peels on the seder plate to represent um uh, the um enslavement of jews during the holocaust and how they okay. potato peels um and the warsaw ghetto uprising took place on the first night of of passover yeah. it began on the first night of passover um and so i thought that was that was particularly interesting. There are all sorts of fascinating things that people do to add to the rituals to make them their own. Um, it's I think it's one of the one of the really appealing parts of the holiday. Yeah, and since I converted, and and while like I I am culturally, uh, it's weird. Like I'm single, so like culturally, I didn't marry into a Jewish family to pick up minhag or traditions from them but i'm not going to pretend like i'm pretty ashkenazi in my traditions uh-huh um which is eastern european based um but i do uh there's like a safar i think it's a sephardic tradition an iraqi tradition maybe of using uh green onions during dayenu to represent uh-huh. uh like slave like the whips of slavery um but then we just die laughing uh, because we're all like trying to hit each other with green onions that are getting more and mil- more wilted the more the louder and louder we sing Dianu. But so that is just like a hilarious addition that I've we've done some years where we're hitting each other with onions. We had a guest one year and I don't remember who it was. Um but I think his family was Sephardi. Mm-hmm. Maybe they were, maybe they were Egyptian. I don't remember. But he said they had a tradition that before the seder started, each person, like we'd go around the table, and um, each person would be asked. They'd like they sit like this, as if they're holding a bag over their shoulder. Mm-hmm. It was Syrian. Thank you. It was Syrian, 
and people would say, where are you, where are you leaving? And the person would say, Egypt, or Mitzrayim, which is Hebrew for Egypt. And then they'd say, where are you going? And they'd say, Jerusalem. And it's sort of like... And they'd say, what do you have? What is that for your hand? And what did they say? Hey, you... Come over here so that you're closer to the microphone. Tag team. Tag team podcast. Oh, yeah. And then Hi. The, the third question, which is, what is that on your shoulder? And, and what did they say? I think it was Lechem or something. Oh, something about the, matzah, I think. The or, poor man's bread that's at the or, very or beginning the of the Seder. Or the bread of freedom or something. Better... Those. I think it was something about the matzah is my recollection. But it was so cool because we went around the table and each person was asked the same three questions mm -hmm. and each person answered the same way. And it it sort of set the scene. Hmm. You know, like, um, is it a dinner party? Is it a is it a religious ritual, or is this a story of experience? Right. Um, it, oh, that's it, so it, interesting. I love I love um, picking those things up through the years too, and folding them into your own experience. And uh, I also use <coughs> Hagadot.com every year. Mm -hmm. um, which is a, a website full of clips that people have uploaded their family clips. They've uploaded organizations, upload extra readings. And so I have, I, I have one that I build on every year. And then because m my friends are not strictly observant, I, I send them the PDF and they can print it. They can bring uh, an iPad, they can bring their phone. Sure. And, and so it's actually been really nice because we've gotten to a place where people bring we're not wasting as much paper any like the way we used to. We used to print them out, would have the year on the front, and then I'd collect them and I would add them to my pile of things to take to the synagogue. Um, but now, for the most part, people are doing Kindle, iPad, or will, you know, like last year I just shared my screen. It was on Zoom. So I just had to make one and I shared the screen. <laughs> so that was nice. You know, so I, did, I was not raised... Um, observant to the level that I am right now. Yeah. And um, I remember one year in the 80s, my mom, this, you know, like, we were kids in the 80s. We'll understand this. But it was, this really dates us. Um, my mom went somewhere and rented a camcorder. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's like the big camcorder that you're holding over your shoulder. And she wanted to record the Seder. Yeah. So, you know, that's cool. I, I don't know if she had in her mind that, like, the people sitting around the table wouldn't always be there. All of the people around the table lived another 25, 30 years. Thank goodness. Yeah. But um, I just remember she asked, my Aunt Gloria had this recipe for gefilte fish, and she made it twice a year. She made it for Rosh Hashanah. She made it for Passover. And she would she would give some to all of her neighbors in her, like, in her condo complex to sort of apologize for the fact that it she was making her. a felt of fish. Right. <laughs> um, but so she was, she was sitting there and someone said, you know, Aunt Gloria, how do you make the gefilte fish? And I'm sure this video no longer exists, which is really a shame. But she was like, well, you tell the fishmonger you need white fish and you need pike. And, and she would go, she went through the whole thing as we're sitting there. And I don't know if I, as, you know, maybe an eight year old kid was like, okay, are we going to eat now? Right. And I did not appreciate gefilte fish in 1985. No. Um, but, it, you know, it, I remember that, and I remember that someone was walking, like, from the living room and through the kitchen, like, in your standard, like, L-shaped living room, dining room. Yeah. And, you know, none of us knew how to use a camcorder. We didn't understand the finer... Sure. Form, like, turning it off when you're moving from one point to another. No. <laughs> so, you know, 10 seconds of the recording is like, this is linoleum on the kitchen floor. And, you know... It's funny because we know, like, it's yeah. that's what it was. But I, I remember that recording. Um, oh, that's amazing. I wonder if your mom rented it at U-Haul. That's where we would rent VCRs when we were, like, we would rent VCRs and movies originally from U-Haul. I mean, I can tell you, I don't know the name of the business, 
but I can see it. Like it was in the, like the, sh- not even a strip mall, but like in the shopping center next to our main grocery store. Right. Um, that probably doesn't exist anymore in its current form. Um, that was crazy. One time I was at the, I think this was a Seder. I don't, I'm pretty sure it was a Seder. Um, my cousin uh, and her husband run uh, the Chabad in Brookline, Massachusetts. Okay. Or, um, and so I spent a lot of time with them when I was living in Boston. Um, and I was at this like huge Seder that they had. And I was like in the kitchen doing prep. And I was talking to this woman. And I realized that like I didn't know her. But I like new mutual people. Right. And you know, sometimes that's comfortable and sometimes it's a weird dance because uh-huh. we're not sure what to say. And I must have said something. I, I don't know what I said, but she looked at me and she said, How did you know that about me? And I, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I was like, uh, uh, I went on two dates with your brother. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I knew this thing about her. I never oh. her that night. I love Jewish geography. It was just like that was this just wild moment. Wild, wild moment. Oh, that is something else. I went on two dates with your brother. I mean, Amazing. Well, I guess I didn't lead both satyrs both of those years in Boston, since clearly I went to my cousin Seder for one of those years. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Do you, um, does your family have any, what's your traditional meal for breaking, say for breaking Passover? Are you a pizza family or do you? Neil goes out for pizza. Neil goes out for pizza. Yeah. I don't eat dairy, so I can't eat pizza. Okay. Um, but yes, pizza for sure. It's what we always broke Passover with. Yeah. Um, definitely. Um, I remember going when I was in college, there was this bar that we'd go to and we, we would go there and we'd like watch the clock. Cause we knew like, it was funny. Like we weren't, we weren't observant in terms of like the last two days being holiday days, my friend, right. but we knew like, Oh, Passover is over at 7:25 p.m. Uh-huh. And so we would go and we'd get our seats and and everything and then we were like we would like the pizza to come out at this time. <laughs> we cannot have it before. Is there anything I haven't asked you about Passover that you would be if we hung up without you saying you would be sad not to share? So one of the things I didn't think of when I was making you a list and thinking about tonight was when I was in college, I took this course on storytelling and I, um, and I made for one of the projects, a storytelling Haggadah. So gathering stories from lots of people, from family, from friends. And like, you know, this is the late nineties. This is early internet Mm -hmm. on some list serves. And um, I got such interesting stories. I learned about um, there's this whole story about a group of Civil War soldiers who made a Seder like in like they asked for a couple of days off in. I don't remember where they were, maybe somewhere in maybe somewhere in Ohio. We have a children's book that's Mm -hmm. on the story, but I have an account of it in here. And there were, so I was on, through my high school youth group, I was on different listservs. And I just basically, any any group I was in on the internet, like the three groups I was in on the right. internet, then I sent out this request. I was like, oh, I'm looking for stories relating to your family's Seder. So this one guy sent me a story about when Alan Tipper Gore came to his family's Seder. Oh. Um, okay, so the short for so this uh, person who sent this to me, his mother wrote this up. Um, and uh, her husband was a rabbi in Nashville. And so they invited um, their congressman, Al Gore, and his wife, Tipper, to the Seder. Mm-hmm. And there are about 35 people there, and it's a lively affair. And the Gores asked lots of questions. 
about what was going on. Like, that's why you why you invite, like, a wide variety of people, Jews right. and Jews. And then she says, this was written by Donna Glazer. I want to give her credit for what I'm going to read. Finally, the big moment arrived. Time for the matzah and horseradish sandwich. Now, you need to understand that the horseradish at our Seder is not just the regular bottled variety found in the supermarket. Not for this family. Our horseradish was imported by my parents who brought it with them from Rochester, New York. It is especially strong, made by a member of the Rochester Jewish community. Customers flocked to him from all over the country. The warning went out. Proceed cautiously with the horseradish. Those who had been with us before watched the congressman heap his matzah with horseradish. No. no. Right? right? So we all know where this is going. He took a huge... But Al Gore does not. He does not know where it's going. <laughs> he does not. Uh, he took a huge bite, nodded, and said, that's not so bad. All of a sudden, his face turned bright red as the horseradish traveled a little higher. He broke out the word water. It took 10 minutes before his face got back to normal and he was able to laugh at himself and woo with him. Um, and then, like, he's talking, then, like, the conversation continues and he's talking about all sorts of different things. And he, and they had a great time. And, um, and she ends this by saying, it was a wonderful Seder. We were all sad to see it end, even though it was already one o'clock in the morning. We hear that whenever Al Gore spoke to Jewish audiences after that memorable Seder, he would say, when I had Seder at the rabbis, he got lots of mileage out of that Seder and so did we. Uh, prescient. Here comes. Who knows? If he becomes president, maybe we'll invite them again. This time he can bring the horseradish. <laughs> uh, so I, I thought that was very funny. And then years later, I was staffing a teen trip in Washington, D.C. Mm-hmm. And this program often used recent college graduates as their staff. Yeah. I came with a group of teens from Chicago. They had recent college graduates. So I'm talking to the, this young man who's there, and he had the same name, the same last name, and he said he was from Nashville. And I said, oh, I, I like, wrote up this, I, like, I have this funny story that, like, was included in this, this Haggadah that I made. And he said, that's my family's story. Um, Amazing. But then I said, um, oh, well, what was it like that night? He said, oh, I wasn't born yet. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, Oh. what a baby. I, you know, it was, it was a very interesting moment, but I like that story. I mean, it's, it's, it's a great story. I love a Hillel sandwich. I love Haroset and horseradish mixed together. It is my favorite flavor combination of the night it 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 is definitely i would say the highlight did you by chance see the picture i posted this week of my daughter uh in her eyes bugging out we were talking about maror okay radish we listened to this podcast that asked why does hot sauce make your eyes run and i was like Mm -hmm. oh this is like maror or make your nose run excuse me Mm -hmm. eyes and as she was listening to it, her eyes got wider and wider. So we've been talking about whether the kids are going to try horseradish this year. Ooh, that's exciting. I think th- I think they should try a tiny bit. Yeah. Um, I I don't know that they will, mm-hmm. but I'm going to encourage them to try it. Yeah. And I'll have the pink one on hand because it's not as harsh as the white one. Right. Yeah. Can we talk about Haroset? Haroset yeah. is a huge highlight. Um, it's, it's supposed to represent the mortar of making bricks. Um, and it's the way I was raised, it was apples and nuts and wine and cinnamon. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was an adult before I discovered that the Sephardi world makes a far superior chloroset. Oh, really? With like, uh, dried fruit, Mm. um, dates apricots and you put it in a food processor and it makes a, a really nice paste yeah um it's not as dry uh, yes. um it's more tangy um completely superior i'll, I'll make the regular oh, not i shouldn't say regular i'll make the ashkenazi one that i was raised with yeah but um i don't think i have made it the last couple of years because the last couple of years have been tough um and just yeah. been but I think I, I might make the, the Sephardi one again. Yeah. Um, I often 
get my hero set as because I'm doing second night and people are coming from like their family satyrs. Like a lot of people go to their family, the fir- extended family first night, friend satyr second night in my uh-huh. community. Um, so a lot of times I will just ask people to bring leftover hero set from night one. I mean, you cannot go wrong with that. And then you can get like a buffet. Yes. Of hero set. You know, a fun thing to do with leftover hero set, if you have such a thing, which I understand if people don't. Mm -hmm. Um, Last year, I put some on a piece of salmon. Ooh, that Uh, would be nice. Like, (coughs) just simply stuck it on, smushed it over it, baked it. Yeah. It was pretty good. Um, the one year when I made it myself, I bought, um, pomegranate seeds because I am lazy and pomegranate juice and apples and like honey and some wine. And so I did like a pomegranate forward hero set. That was really nice. I like that. That sounds really good. Yeah. Like that palm wonderful juice. Uh huh. You know, like you just buy a little bottle of that and, and then like the palm pomegranate seeds are right next to it. And then you. Yeah, it was, and then cinnamon, and it was a really nice, fun, fun, fun one. Well, Carolyn, this has been so fun. It's we are both up, best. absolutely close to our bedtimes. Yes, very. Good. <laughs> <laughs> um, d- do you have anything you want to promote, or do you want you people to follow you on the internet? Um, you can follow me on Instagram. Um, my, uh, handle is Carolyn, uh, E-R. So it's C-A-R-O-L-I-N-E-E-R-7-7. Um, I keep trying to change it and not finding something that hasn't been taken. So that's where you can find me, um, on Instagram. And I think I post interesting things about food, smashing the patriarchy, yeah. And um, dabbling in parenting. Yeah. And and also like Jewish uh, Daf Yomi sometimes. Yes. And, and, and Jewish. Well, that you spun off, right? I did. I spun off for Daf Yomi, which is a daily Talmud study that I do. Mm-hmm. So <clears throat> if you would like to follow me on that, that account is called hashtag Daf Yomi. And I post about the interesting uh, things that I find in um, in my daily uh, Talmud study. I don't post every day, mm-hmm. um, but I try to post when I find things that are particularly interesting or speak to my heart, or um, or things that I think are are known in Jewish culture. And and it's like, oh, here's the source. This is right. where it's from. Yes. Um, I like finding those moments and saying that this is, this is the, this is, this is it. Um, so yeah, hash, at hashtag Dafiomi and at Carolyn ER77. Um, I'd be happy to have you unless you are a bot. Um, Cause I block those. Yeah. Down with bots. Um, you can follow me on Instagram at Shylea on Twitter at Chicago Leah, uh, finding faves pod on also on Twitter and Instagram. Um, follow, I think it is now called following on Apple podcasts, uh, leave five stars, uh, all the big podcasts say it really helps. So I say it really helps too. (laughs) Absolutely. Uh, It must, it must be true. Um, well, thank you so much, Carolyn. This has been a blast. It has been so much fun. Thank you. Happy Passover to you. Chag Sameach, which is a way to say it in Hebrew, um, to everyone who observes the holiday. And for everyone else, um, I hope you enjoyed my talking about recipes. It was great. Thank you for listening to Finding Favorites with Leah Jones. Please make sure to subscribe and drop us a five-star review on iTunes. Now, go out and enjoy your favorite things.